I came into the business <laughs> of the Central University. Um, anyone uh, ever dealt with the old <laughs> network general sniffer or DOS? Where they could troubleshoot 10 megabits and say, you know, you could say hello to every single packet and you could operate it on one with one hand. That was neat. But <laughs> now looking at networks with 100 gigabits per second, that's something different. So a little bit, something about my bio. Um, I worked for Network Trainer and Network Associates for rock, roughly eight years before I was made redundant. <laughs> That's always what can happen to you when you work for a US company. I've be become a freelancer and then started my Wireshark career. And well, I've now been working for roughly 11 years for the company called Expertise. Well, this was me. <laughs> Well, some 20 years ago. And you may recognize this, this young man with still some dark hair and strong voice. He was one of the, uh, well, let's say, the very first Sniffer University instructor Europe has ever seen. And maybe one of the best. So, um, it's the old blame game. Part one of this presentation will be what about if the network really breaks? How? And when I talk about network, I mean network infrastructure. It's not about end systems. It's about anything that can be in between. Which is routers. I'm not a router guy. I'm a router guy, OK? <laughs> I hope this is OK. If you come from the US, a router may be more appealing to you than a router. But I learned, it, I learned British English at school. <coughs> But while well, my pronunciation got screwed up for being in the US for three months, so, so that's something different. Um, I've got trace files, which I could use to demonstrate, well, how to tackle in part one, especially packet loss. When you experience packet loss on TCP, you could be in a bad position, yes or no. Well, it depends on the rate of packet loss and how great it is. It may depend on the application itself. How sensitive are applications with regard to packet loss? Well, we don't know. We'll have to find out. But just looking at the trace file, that's, that is what will on, only be half of the story. And you can use uh, the Wireshark <laughs> as long as you want. The only trouble is, once you kind of isolate a, a, a problem, you get, a, get up from your desk and go out into your network trenches and check what is really responsible. So it's about isolating problems, starting with the network. And if the network is fine, hmm, then we can continue in this session as part two, which is about application-related problems, especially when it comes down to database applications. Well, in every, every enterprise has got database applications. <laughs> Enterprise resource, but management or ERP applications. Everybody has one. And are they all happy with that? Hmm, I hope so. But if something goes wrong, we need to find out where to start troubleshooting. This is where um, I would say, let's play, let's do the referee job. Is it the network? If yes, we need to fix it. If it's not the network, we can at least isolate where to start troubleshooting. One of my mentors once said, well, you might have heard of him. It's Jasper, actually. So, I chose to, that, 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 should, that should be my, my agenda here. I also want to um, spend a little bit of time on how to approach a problem. But you can follow the slides, maybe later on offline or with the presentation. I'll be shortened up a little bit because I've, I've got four trace files for this, uh, for this piece, for this part, and well, if you, if you are open to follow me on that, we can try to figure out stuff together, how to address this or this or that problem. I can show you or tell you how I attack one or the other problem, and you could share how you could do it, or what you read out of a trace file, because all our approaches might be different. 
once we do it together, we should be very strong. So when I look at trace files, I always see, see, seek to check with somebody else who can also look at the same trace file and discuss things with me, especially when things become very complicated. <coughs> so, and this would be part two. Well, I now I have to compete with the packet doctors. <laughs> that really will be a tough job. But if you, if you like this part, you feel free to choose either the packet doctors with Dr. Saki, um, Dr. whatever. Yeah. And, or you may stay in this room. I will do the database stuff. So is it the network? Yes or no? That's assumption number one. If something goes wrong, have you heard about it? Is it the network? Yes. Who's to blame? It's always the network. Why? I don't know. Uh, have you ever heard of the sentence, your network is low? Anyone? Mm -hmm. Are you getting annoyed with that? I'm doing, the, I'm doing the friendly part now. I'm usually <laughs> speaking <coughs> a bit differently, especially in, my, in German. Hmm. Why is it always the network? Well, one, pe one person once stepped up to me and said, well, maybe because of Microsoft on the exchange in Apple system. Because any time when an Apple client is not able to access this exchange server on time, the client would open up a small window and, and, and say, hey, your network is broken. It is just by means of the response time which was too high and which would exceed the threshold, but still, it is the network. Hmm. I'm getting pissed off about that. So is the, the sorry, uh, it's being reported. So, assumption number two, is uh, assumption number two, uh, number one <coughs> is not true, you can still go back to assumption number one. Rule of thumb, it's always the network. Well, if it is the network, we need to find out where, what, and what to do. And this is where Wireshark comes into play. <laughs> no one wants to be blamed. But we need to find solutions to problems. We need to fix things rather than doing the finger pointing stuff. This is what I usually prefer, finding solutions and finding proof. And whenever we need to forward something to a manufacturer to a vendor of software or hardware, whatever, he says we need a PCAP. Because then we can be sure if we are able to capture all the, the packets from off the wire correctly with some great tool, if you are 100% sure that you captured all the data, then you can start with the evaluation. So that's about the, the motivation why we do it in wire in wire shark. Okay? So that the finger pointing stops. The blaming is not any oh there's an L missing. The blaming is not uh, necessary anymore and we can start dealing with the with the problem itself. So I know Wireshark can be used in, in <coughs> several different ways. My major is if something already broke I get in and try to fix it. So whenever I come to a site, even my own company once or twice a year has got a problem. And I get called too, because when, when, this, when the networking guys run out of ideas, switches, routers, <coughs> firewalls, whatever, everything, uh, they can't isolate the problem, then they can't find the root cause, cause and the wire shock. Folks, folks are called. So um, you start, what is the problem? So that would, would be number one. And what is the impact on the users? When you've got several different problems, you kind of <coughs> need to prioritize them. And start maybe with this or with that or with that. And when you come to a customer side and someone says, hmm, well, once you're here, after we've got that major problem, by the way, this in it with our accounting software and that and that, everything. Okay, let's start with number one and tackle this one. And once this is solved, then we can move, 
we may move to the problem number two. But please keep things in order. Maybe if you solve problem number one, problem number two may go away. Maybe it's not of that high priority. That could be something different. Well, depending on the problem and the definitions, what, are, what, what, is your, what is your aim? What is your goal? And that also defines usually your capture location. If it is a client-related problem, you may you want, want to see what uh, put, put your Wireshark towards the client. If it is more server-related, maybe you're up to the server. If you, if you think the network could be the problem between two sites on a WAN, over a WAN link, um, maybe you get, you need two captures. So it could be either way. So, and then it is a problem, or a, a question is, is it an intermittent problem? That's a problem that comes and goes away. And usually, rule of thumb, if intermittent problems occur and somebody was a, wearing a laptop with a wire shark, the problem is goes away. But just for the time for the, of the consulting team on site. And <laughs> I swear, when you, when you return from that site back home, you'll get an instant call, oh, the problem is there again. So what happened? I haven't got a clue. That means we need some long-term captures, and we, we may look at, need to look at time or, or whatever. The second thing is, if it is a repeatable problem, then it's better. You need then some activity, restart, to pick up, and have them captured and see whether the package actually makes sense in the chase mask. So, and my rule of thumb, because <coughs> I've always worked for the networking folks, identify if the network is okay, but <laughs> it's again <coughs> troubleshooting with the OSI layer. If you've got problems on layer one and layer two, your applications may suffer from and So fix this first. If the network is OK on first and second side, maybe a server. But that depends on the application. We need to find out what kind of applications are sensitive to well, bandwidth, delay, whatever. But that's something for part two of this presentation. And then server means also storage. I once ran into a shop which had severe storage problems. <laughs> with some hard drives. They were, they, they were turning at 7,200, um, I think, revolutions per minute. That fast, no flash drive, nothing. They had I.O. times <coughs> over, um, that were greater than two or three seconds on a constant basis. So if you're running it in your storage network and your SAN system has got I.O access over two or three seconds, up to 10 seconds, just to access this bloody drive, you're out of business. So that was their problem, and their bottleneck. So, what ca how can we check if the network is okay? Any ideas? What are metrics that show us that uh, a, the network is, is working properly? What? What are you doing? Just a question. How do you check that the network is working properly? Latency. Latency? How do you, uh, how do you uh, get, get to evaluate the latency? So are you doing it in an active work? Yeah, ping. Could work, yeah. What else? Latency is always a big issue when it comes to wave connections. When, <laughs> if, you're, if your data center is somewhere in Europe, and you've got branches all over the globe. Some latency may be an issue because data centers have to kind of move into one location, maybe into the cloud, and you never know where the cloud is. Um, latency is something important. Um, is ping a good tool to, to check latency? It depends, okay. Well, that's the lawyer section. <laughs> it, it, they always say fine, it depends, okay. Uh, it depends on what? Uh, <laughs> yes. If your application I'm is, for example, uh, is using for the service, okay. for different tools and your ICP 
Mm -hmm. You could do your thing even in your quality of service class. Mm -hmm. Then you're out of business again. When it, com when it comes to software defined networks, the network is just a, let's say, a black hole that can be utilized by applications. And you never know how those networking devices should kind of act. That's just my kind of sarcastic approach to that. I should, I, I'm sure they will do a better job. Right? Well, latency. If they, well, and I do it via TCP. When I'm troubleshooting TCP applications, I do it via the round trip time. I go into it passively. If the round trip time means okay, between any two locations within some limits, I say, okay, that's indication number one. Round trip time, okay. So you've got to know what the typical round trip time should be. If you see that the round trip time is still okay, you could move forward and maybe move your capture location to the data center. That was one client that had a gig link over 60 kilometers, <laughs> pure fiber. And it had a latency of four milliseconds, round trip. So one gig, five milliseconds, 60 kilometers away. Is this a good, <coughs> is, is, that, is, is this a good value or reasonable? No, one gig, 60 kilometers. I thought it was, we did a thing. But do your baseline. Anything that that is normal to the extent that that, that really um, people say yes, we can live with that should be recognized as state of the art now. And you can move. Yeah, it's it's just your latency, your run time depends on well the distance and mainly on the minimal bandwidth between any two places. And the rest is just queuing and processing mode. <coughs> so, but I don't want to cover the, the round trip time this time. I want to look at other things. And um, for the starting point for me is always I look at the expert. And sh I know that the TCP expert of Wireshark is not, hmm, is, it, it is not telling me always the truth and giving me an entire picture. But it's a good starting point, especially when it comes to my major topic, packet loss. Have you experienced packet loss so far? Does that happen? Oh, by the way, this is for yes, this is for no, and if you're not sure what to do, just do it, do this. It helps to digest better. So, have you ever experienced packet loss? Yes. Mm -hmm. So, what is a typical rate of packet loss before we could, before we we could say yes, this is not good, this is too bad for us, because what is a good value? Hmm. Any idea? Is it one percent, two percent? Less. Less. Yeah. I, I would rather say yeah, less, and it also depends on. Well, is it within one site? I would say zero reach packages, packets lost. I hope nothing is, <coughs> is lost in a, in a local data center on a, or on a local campus. If it's on a dedicated web link, let's say an MPLS connection across 200 milliseconds, you could live with some retransmissions or packet, or packet loss, but just to a certain extent. It depends on your service level. And on the internet, this threshold, when to get up from your desk and actually start troubleshooting, could be simply higher. But that also depends on the application. Some applications are not, too, not so sensitive to packet loss. <laughs> Voice over IP on a decent, good codec, like <coughs> 711. Some, some web guy said, oh, well, I can go with up to 5% packet loss. Well, not at once. It's just spread across the entire conversation, maybe. Well, and the issue is, whenever there is are problems with packet loss, the reasons for that could be really mm, a 
couple of them. Now, what I usually do when I st start troubleshooting, I first look at TCP. When, it's, when it comes down to TCP-oriented um, applications, and if my TCP is fine, I go up the stack and look at client-server communication depending on the application. If my, if my TCP shows problems, I go for, dig further down, and this is where Eddie, I think it was it yesterday, when he did this tracing uncharted network. Anyone, anyone uh, saw, saw Eddie Blankers with his presentation yesterday? So this is where, you know, he, he built the base where I'm swimming in with my shark. Um, if there are problems like this on layer two or layer three, you might end up with packet loss. Well, on my, on my favorite hit list is a duplex mismatch. Typical thing. Do you know what this is about? So two switches maybe, or two Ethernet stations. <coughs> One says, I'm gonna work in full duplex mode. The other side, Chappie says, yes, well, we'll do half duplex. Well, if your normal link capacity is one gig, <laughs> your throughput might jump down to one meg. So it's 0.1% maybe, and you'll end up with loads of collisions. So you never know. Um, other problems, I'll leave that as a list. So, and maybe, it's maybe, it's maybe one, ICMP error related messages. If, whenever I see ICMP, I'm curious whether it is ping or echo or anything else. So Eddie also built a filter for that to eliminate all the pings and echo echoes for it. For it. And here my top cat, my top four list <laughs> actually, and I run it times beyond any limits. Packet loss and result in TCP retransmissions. Problem with uh, the throughput. And with regard to TCP window, well, a TCP window is the buffer on either side uh, of a TCP connection. And when the receiver is about to receive a huge file across the network, sometimes the window will just be too small to accept <coughs> all the data that has been put on the wire and for the first acknowledgement to return. It's about transporting high loads of data across long fat networks, LFMs. Um, so if you, if you need to upload a file to one of those AIDA uh, cruise ships, and a colleague of mine once needed to do that, you end up uh, with round trip times of roughly one second. So you'd need a window, TCP window, <coughs> of maybe 20 megs, maybe 10. You can do the math, depending on the bandwidth. If your TCP window on the, on the receiving side is too slow, is too low, well then you're out of business. So you can do the math how to do that. But that also is nothing of my interest. And number four is, oops, there was one. If I get problems with refused connections, well, I can see loads of TCP in the trace path, especially when dealing with HTTP or HTTPS. When you're surfing the net, the net when you're accessing the cloud. Well, in HTTP, if the client issues a reset on TCP, at the end of the session, it's pretty normal. If the server does a reset, then you might end up in this, and you've got the exhaustive to investigate for it, because this is usually an indication of a problem. So T TCP resets from client, rather not. But we'll have to see. So I'm going to focus just on TCP. <laughs> Two things. If your application is transporting data across UDP, then your faith that you may, that you may lose packets from site A to site B, what can you do? Any idea? Well, you need, you need, you need, to, cap, you need to capture on, the, on either side and you, you, you need to do the math. How many packets have been sent out? And how many of those packets have actually arrived at, at, the, at your second site, at site B? How many are returned? And how many will come back to site number A? Well, once, 
a major uh, service provider had a problem on their network with SNMP. They were sending a huge amount of SNMP requests out, and eventually two or three wouldn't be answered. So their management alarm system went off, and they had they wanted to send out their stuff somewhere across Germany to <laughs> to get this stuff sorted. Well. Those network elements, those routers, switches, ansans, or whatever, they were fine. It was just that this that this bloody SNMP re, uh, response wouldn't make it back back eventually. So when you need to tra troubleshoot packet loss on UDP, <laughs> it's difficult. The only thing is when you're troubleshooting packet loss for voice over IP connections in RTP. <laughs> Well, the expert for RTP and packet loss is there. You go to telephony, RTP, and look at the screen data, screen by screen, and you'll instantly find out if there was packet loss present or not. Hmm. And if you end up with a packet loss of 40% on the video stream, it's not, a, not, it's not really surprising that this video connection is a, it really sucks. So that happened to us. So with that, the manufacturer is still puzzled whether it is the network or his devices. <laughs> but on TCP, it could be something else. Now, when you look at packet loss in a LAN environment, I wouldn't accept any packet loss. And to be something below, above nil, I'd say one packet per hour. But at least that you have not nothing. On an MTLS, it's maybe one. A thousand <coughs> on the internet is maybe one percent. I don't know. So you got to differentiate when your applications really suffer from packet loss, and really that depends on the application and the type of industry you're working in. If you've got, got just a bunch of users browsing the internet for whatever reason, maybe part time on the private for private use, <laughs> some packet loss is not the pain in the neck. If you are work, working for a financial in, in, a company, trading company, then packet loss often. Well, within a, with, with, within a time frame smaller than a second or a millisecond, that could become, that could become a, minor, a, 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 sorry, a major issue. So it really depends on the application. So listen to the people yelling at you, trying to identify which one is critical and which one is not. Now, what is the source? Why do we lose packets? Think about a WAN connection between any two sites. Why are we losing packets? So that's a kind of short list. And especially not only why, but where. And if you've got other ideas, I'm open. Feel free to shout it into the room right away. Now, the thing that happens to me very often is in routers or firewalls, we may have packet loss, but due to two reasons. One is if the process, if, let's say, it, if the internal CPU is running at 90%, your router is, is about to drop packets. So it's inside the device on overload. You've got to check about those those processes and what they are good for. I once was able to, <laughs> to build a switching loop with a, let's say, small dumb switch that had any spanning tree in it. So I did, I did the switching loop by accident well, and our router went up to 95% of CPU utilization. Guess what? It was the ARP process. And that rang a bell. So if the R process, which is basically broadcast, if it was a broadcast being, <laughs> being, being constantly multiplied by that spanning tree loop. <laughs> Once I pulled, it, I pulled out the cable out, out of the switch, it was gone. So it was good. Um, and the rest, usually, when you connect a uh, company site to the provider, if you haven't got enough bandwidth, and there is always not enough bandwidth. So if, you pro if your provider link is about 50 megabit, megabit per second or 100, 
And what rate can you run this on a constant basis? A 50% neutralization, an 80, 70. But if it's too much, you're going to lose packet. So if, you, if there is not enough bandwidth available, you'll, you're losing packets. But where? So you've got your router that connects you to the provider. And he's kind of shaping your packets or kind of polishing your packets down to a certain hmm, service level that you've been paying for. Well, where are the packets actually going? I think it's in the router itself, in the outbound queue. And you, the only thing you can do, up to a certain utilization of your queues, that you do some, pla some clever quality of service deployment to, well, to prefer some of the applications against the others. That would help, eventually. But if your utilization of your link goes up over a certain extent, then you could do as much work as you, you, you like. It wouldn't change anything. Your network would, would be your really in general. So <coughs> sometimes it's that. Sometimes it's just like a duplex mismatch. I swear you've got packet loss. Because there will be collisions all over the place on the local link and you'll end up with packet loss. Take care of that one. And one of my favorites, half MTU discovery. If you're running a VPN connection across the WAN link where your, where your LAN data is, get, is getting encapsulating, encapsulated into like those, those IPsec headers, whatever, your packet is going to be larger. If it's too large for the provider, <laughs> you've got a problem. And this is where there's a, well, an RFC has been written, I think some centuries ago. I don't know how many, at least 12, I believe. Um, it's, it's an RFC about path MTU discovery. Hmm. But let's say three out of five customers have got that problem because that's path MTU discovery it doesn't work. But this is just what happens. So there are multiple reasons. And what we're going to see is whenever someone sends out a packet and that specific packet gets lost and the sender has got more to send to it, the act number will freeze because are you familiar with the TCP sequencing act stuff, how this goes, how this is, is meant to, be, to work? So the sender has got a sequence number he picked himself, he's sending out data and for every single <coughs> byte being transported the act number has to increase from the receiving side. So good news is always if the act number increases constantly if there is data being received. But the problem being, whenever there is out of a series of four, maybe here, if one packet gets lost and there are subsequently more packets being sent, and by the way, this should be the sequence number, and we're always sending out 100 bytes, the acknowledgement number can't be in increased because there is only one number. And that means we need to have any, every packet up to that specific number received without any, without any gaps. So this single act number cannot work with, with any gaps in, in between. And then two things may happen. Either a timer goes off which we call the RTO timer, retransmission timeout. That would be recognized by Wireshark as a normal. And it's fast. If it's, if it's going faster than that, then um, you, you may see retransmissions pretty before those RTO goes off, and then Wireshark is tempted to say this is a fast retransmission on top of that normal flag for retransmission. So, and there, are more, there is more to it. If you want to read through this, this is just some samples how you could uh, attack those kind of problems. Overload within the device or at the WAN interface. I ran it on the Cisco router and look at processes on the interface statistics. <laughs> and very often, routers have got a 
internal process like Cisco within Cisco Express forwarding, which keeps the packet on its data plane and the throughput time, or the time putting the, the packet <coughs> from one interface in, inbound to the outbound, will be maybe a tenth of the time it, will, it may require through the control plane and through the, through the CPU. So if someone switches a, on a Cisco router, if you switch off this IP Cisco Express forwarding, <laughs> you're going to start losing packets maybe at 10 or 20 or even 30 percent. Well, we made it up to 40 percent within our data center. So, and the same for duplex mismatch. We'll cover that. And that was my topic. That was the example with past MTU discovery that doesn't work. Are you familiar with that one? Again, this is yes, this is no. Shall I explain it to you briefly? Okay. So let's start, let's let's take the assumption we are on the LAN, and the MTU on the LAN is 1,500 bytes. Well, that dates back to Ethernet. Ethernet was built with a maximum frame size. Well, it was of 15, 18 bytes, and if you remove the Ethernet header and trailer, you end up with an IP. It's, it's basically the size of a layer three packet, the maximum size. And you'll find it on every single IP-based device. The MTU is somewhere in it. And typically, it's 1,500 bytes, unless you move to jumbo frames. So, and when there is a WAN connection with a lower MTU, what can you do? Well, the past MTU discovery, the RFC, requests that you send out your data with a specific don't write with bit, all TCP data. And if the packet has got a smaller size, it will traverse the routers and get to the end. But if there is a long packet, full packet, coming to that router, the router you, know, you should use, would usually do, a fragmentation. But we don't allow it do the fragmentation, and so we may force an ICMP error message, which says destination unreachable, fragmentation needed. Ever seen that? <laughs> That's my top, let's say, out of the, when I, do con when I count all my consulting cases from the last 10 years. That's on my hit list on the, in, within the top five, always. I thought it would get, get better someday. So, and this should force retransmissions at a smaller frame size. So the, the, the sender receiving those, that ICMP message would read the MTU out of this packet and start retransmissions at a lower frame size or packet size. Eventually, that will work. Eventually. Number one, only if ICMP is being sent. Number two, only if that client really complies to that RFC. Otherwise, you're out of business again. And guess what? In our case, within my, my own company, it was, this was the, the remote site. The router would send ICMP, <coughs> but you always need to do it at that remote site. And the firewall, the corporate firewall, at our headquarters, wouldn't send any ICMP. Well, then we would send out Large, large frames, large packets, and this will become a black hole. So the router would have, will have to dump the packets, and then the TCP connection died. By the way, if you've got a Windows client and a Windows server, and the packet gets lost, how often will the sender try to retransmit the packet before it will give up? Any idea? <coughs> So how many retransmissions on a single packet? Hmm. How many attempt? Well, <laughs> Windows documentation says on the initial SYN packet, it's one plus two. So whenever there is a SYN not going, not going through, you'll see one SYN, then a second, and then a third. And the delta times between the first and the second will be three seconds, which is 
so-called the initial run-through time, and between the second and the third, it's six seconds, it doubles. So, rule of thumb, whenever a client or a server runs into this RTO channel, <laughs> it picks the time, freezes it, and for every next packet being lost, it will have to double the retransmission time up to a certain extent. And I've got a trace file taken from a customer side a couple of years ago when they doubled. And this way I, did, I got to know what is the maximum RTO of a Windows machine. I was surprised. It was, a, was 120 seconds. Believe it or not. One packet every two minutes. Wow, that, this is... I could write the packet on a sheet of paper, put it in an envelope, and have my ca ha have a cat run it through from A to B. It would be faster. It's like <laughs> transporting <coughs> data over avian carriers. But it was the first of, of April. That's that was the downside of it. So, you know, if if you if you run into those kind of problems, destination unreachable, fragmentation needed. Check this out. Difficult story. There is a ch there is some there is some check around it. How you can how you can solve this instantly on the router? You limit the maximum segment size of TCP, doing an MSS adjustment, and you'll find it. And on every single Cisco WAN course, I went into or had the pleasure to, to teach. We need to <laughs> we covered that. And by the way. My home, my home router does it automatically, while well, enterprise routers don't. This is what I found. Hmm. Strange. So, another uh, call hit us when, oops. If your bandwidth of the provider is overbooked, if you see stuff like that, you get a transparent Ethernet connection, <coughs> maybe of a 200, 200 megabit Ethernet, and the problem that might occur is you've got a gig interface. So if, you, if you've got a gig interface of Ethernet, <laughs> you're transporting at a, gig, at a gig speed. But in this case, the the provider may just delete all packets that exceed those 200 megabits, and you're again in deep trouble. And for the sake of TCP, whenever whenever TCP experiences packet loss, the sender hits the brake and goes into and into his recovery feature, and that cost, could cost them even more time. So the bandwidth would not exceed maybe 50 or 60 megabit rather than the 200 we, we, we bought. Well, if you do the quality of service thing and do a shaping, maybe to 180 up to 200 megabits, you wouldn't lose too many packets anymore, and you should be better. Now, just before I start into, uh, into like trace files, what does um, Wireshark tell us? Well, any time a packet is lost, I hope that we'll get a retransmission. So this is one of my first one. It's called TCP Problems 1. And if you wish, you can fire it up and look at it. And this is the expert information. Now, how many retransmissions are in the trace? Hmm? How do you count them? Is this 11 and another 11, or does that only count once? Only once. That means <laughs> 11 packets are being, have been retransmitted, and out of these 11, right, 11 were, all of them were fast. That means they have been retransmitted before that timer went off. So, and whenever there's a retransmission, Wireshark could help us. Oops, uh, so and say fast retransmission. That's what we're going to see here. So <coughs> let's put it this way. Let's start with this. Um, 
Are you interested? But I, I, I do, I'll do the demo, but I can, you can also f load the trace file and, and see how it looks on your side. And in the trace files, you will see in part one, uh, or besides part one and part two, also the Wireshark profile I created. This helped me prepare everything so that things actually go faster in the analysis. So, and the profile was just called TCP analysis. Um, most of the trace files have had to run through Trace Wrangler thanks to Jasper who brought that up. Some of them are still original, but it was just by means getting into the internet. Or they are so old, they won't do any harm. So how can we, how can we identify how many retransmissions we actually have? Well, number one, I hit the button. TCP analysis retransmission that tells me how many and what percentage. So. 11 retransmissions on 3,000 packets. Is this serious? What do you think? No. Um, well, where was the gentleman doing the, it depends? <laughs> okay, well, 0.3% within the LAN would be crit could be also already critical. Now, this was an internet connection. 0.3% is not too bad. Do you think the, the user was happy? Well, he was okay. Within the trace, we had a different problem where the user was not, was not so happy because his download got stuck for at least 20 seconds. So he was, he was still <laughs> happy that this would recover. I didn't talk to the customer. I just had the, the trace file. But you, you need to identify whether the, whether the user was happy or not. Plus, is this a constant? Is this a constant base happening, or maybe just once? If it's just once, I don't care. So, zero point three percent. If I look at statistics, at the an uh, uh, analyze and the expert information, this is why I see the rest. Eleven retransmissions. Hmm, okay, let's leave it this way. What about the second trace? The second trace would be, I, uh, I numbered them, one, two, three, four. It's packet underscore loss minus two. And we can take the same approach. I hit on retransmissions. What rate of retransmissions am I going to face in? Is, 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 this, is this a bit more? No. What about those 4%? Is this critical? What do you think the user did? <coughs> and blame it on the network, you guys. Well, that was me being on site at the customer site within the training room. So I got a little bit annoyed, 4%. I wasn't too happy, sure. But what could we do? Hmm. Ask the question, was I the only one who had this problem? Or did this affect all of, my, of the users that were in the same location, maybe in the same room, accessing the same switch? Well, I asked the question. Am I, am I the only one who is, who is suffering from poor downloads and packet loss? <coughs> well, they said, oh, well, I haven't got a problem at all. Me neither. It's just you. And I went, wait a minute. I connected to a Wi-Fi network. And it was a guest network. And they connected to their Wi-Fi network, and it was a corporate SSID. So, what, you, what does usually happen in a, in a guest network at a customer side? Hmm? Any ideas? Your bandwidth is getting, is, is getting limited per session or per user, and which actually makes sense because you may overload 
uh, we just utilize the entire bandwidth. I do the, the same thing when I, uh, we, we do that in our training facilities. <laughs> because people constantly are browsing the network and downloading any YouTube stuff or any whatever files uh, beyond one gig size. <laughs> and next door, our in, in, in our voice classes, the telephones can, can't access their data set, uh, the, the, their switches anymore. So uh, bad luck. So we're limiting the bandwidth. So sometimes it's just by means of asking questions to identify is this, is this supposed to happen or not. Well, what I did was I pulled out the statistics and um, if everything went right in my analysis chart, which should be now TCP analysis too. I pulled out statistics and IO graph, and I just did all packets on a bit scale and the TCP errors just to see when they would occur. And can you identify what the bandwidth limit was for that user? So I had, I hardly had, had any here and there, but at a certain stage, I had retransmissions. Well, and whenever I exceeded that, that limit, and it actually was four megabit per second per user, whenever I exceeded that, packets were dropped, and well, the throughput went down. Well, those could be something to let's say Chris Creer or any, anyone else explaining the back of algorithms of TCP. Well, that's beyond my scope. I'm just trying to identify, is this normal or is it not normal? So that, that's a kind of different approach here. So it was four. And just to do the analysis here, hang on, my second one, the bandwidth limit was about at four megabit. So now, what can I do with this kind of network? Hmm? Is this something we need to troubleshoot? Well, I experienced a bad performance. Hmm. I wasn't supposed to do any better. So the packet loss <coughs> is something that just happens. So I can do, I can I can't really do anything against it, and that was the outcome here. So actually, that was the guest limit for Wi-Fi, and we'll have to see. Whenever we ex we were exceeding four megabit, we have a packet loss, and there was no way around it. Hmm. Okay, but number three was better. If you want to load packet, uh, the trace file number three, it should be still a different story. Hang on, so packet loss. I'll get to the rest a bit later if time allows. So, this was a call. I was at a customer site in the very south of Germany. Um, with some training, I returned, and after five weeks, I got a call. Hey, Matthias. Um, do you agree that the packet loss level is about above the average? And I said, well, if this is the only sample you've got, is this typical for your network? He said, yes, I've got. We've got problems. We've got, which, well, we can't re receive any emails. I did the retransmission filter, and that's, that was our, our percentage. So, 8.2% on a constant basis. Well, it was nice. So, what are we going to do with this? Hmm. Any ideas? Now, this is something we need to troubleshoot. The only question is, well, what is the major question? When you, when you open such a trace file, and you'll identify packet loss, what, were, what is usually the best and the first question to ask? To ask? Any ideas? Where the heck was that trace taken from? What is the network map? 
So we need really need a strong network map. But just out of this, the customer vision <laughs> was not <coughs> accessible for at least two weeks or so. He went on, on vacation. So I, we need to, to, to draw a network map to identify things. Now, the network map for that customer was So, uh, by the way, application was SNTP, and we had 8.6. Now, what can we do? We need to figure out where, it, where the packets have, have actually been captured. We get a, a total of 39, oh, let's say, you know, We just get, yeah, 50, we, we get 56 retransmissions. Hmm. Now the question is, where was this recorded? I'll show you something. And then we'll go through the, the analysis process behind it. Well, we found out the capture location was, well, this, these were the two hosts. This was an, a mail relay, and this was the mail server from, a, from the customer. Well, this was a lo capture location. If you haven't got a network map and you're capturing on Ethernet, you may want to look at the MAC addresses here and there. Well, everything has been sanitized with Grace Wrangler, but only the vendor codes of the, Mac, of the MAC addresses. They still stay. So we found out that this is a Cisco de uh, device and this was a watch guard. So it was the first router to, for, for, for the customer to access the internet and it was that, you know, the, the, red, the red boxes, the firewall services, VPN and anything, and you're not supposed to, to enable everything at once because performance might suffer. That's something we could try to identify. Now, the thing is, and let me get back. Um, hmm, I've got 50 minutes left. I'll see that I can make this story complete. But so that we can finish the session in a proper way. Oops. So, hang on. I'm going back. So, two things happen here. Let's put it this way. This is the theory behind it. If this is my sender, and this is the receiver, and the receiver would just send X back, when it's working fine, the packets, the segments are sent, 100 bytes each, and the egg number goes up. Now, if one packet gets lost, and the second one comes through, Wireshark on the, being on the receiving end would see 100, 200, while the 300 is missing, and then the 400 comes. So what does Wireshark tell us? Previous segment not captured. It says there is a gap in between the packets, the data packets arriving. Make sense? When you, when you move at this towards the center, <coughs> you will see packet number 100, number 2, number 3, number 400 being sent out, because it was before it entered the full domain where the problem actually occurred. So if you see the 100, the 200, 300, 400 being sent, the 500, and then eventually you see the retransmission because the 300 wouldn't, wouldn't make it to the other end. That means on the sender side, you just see the retransmission, and on the receiving end, if you are behind the full domain, you'll see those gaps, so that is the indicator of previous segment not captured. And this is, um, I would say, my experience says it's a pretty precise science. The only thing is you need to check in what directions are the retransmissions actually running. Usually data packets, full data packets, get lost, not the X. If an X gets, uh, gets lost, since they're cumulative, 
Well, a later act will make an older act missing redundant. So acts and acts are cumulative. Don't care about them getting lost. Take care about those retransmissions. Now, if you want to look at the trace path, where all those retransmissions just in one direction or in both? Just for this case. So, that was the packet loss. That was the second packet loss. <coughs> and for the retransmissions. So, this filter shows me all the retransmissions were sent from this to this guy. You may recognize the IP addresses. They come from the documentation area, so it's nothing real, although it looks like they could be of official public addresses. So if I look at this, I see tons of retransmissions from that 203 to the 198. Now, if I try to do it, or if I try to look at the slide and with my network map, Ding dong. This is the this is the point, and this is how we got. Hang on. To the conclusion. Now, this was our point of capture, and the only second symptom you need to look, to watch out for is previous segment of capture, and if they relate to that specific connection. You could even filter on that connection by IP addresses, and then filter, and then limit your expert information down to the display filter, and you would instantly see whether this connection is responsible for the packet loss or not, or for the retransmission. Now, we see 35 <coughs> previous segment of capture, and to repeat, whenever you see that, you are behind the fault domain because you don't see all the original packets dropping in. So, if this is capture location behind because of those symptoms, what are we going to do next? What's your recommendation to the customer? We need to move towards, in the, into the direction there and see how it goes. So they, they, they set up a second capture. I, unfortunately, I haven't got the PCAP. But when, after they did it, they still had packet loss like crazy. So the second capture had previous segment not captured, zero. That's kind of interesting. That means the second capture location was in front of the fault domain. The first one was behind. So this is how you can actually isolate it. Move your wire shark around and your capture location in case of that kind of cap of packet loss. And if this is, this is behind and this is before, the fault domain was this. So next, what's next? What are we going to do next? Hmm? Check the router. Yeah, well, but what they actually did was <laughs> they rather preferred a, a workaround. You can do two things. You can go into the root cause analysis and say, hey, let's check the router. That would be my first thing to do. This, what they did, they just replaced the router <laughs> by a second device. And guess what? After they did it, it was done. They never knew, so they never got to knew what the root cause was. Something between software and hardware. It was a router that needed a, a software update. And whenever you've got a Cisco router that requires a software update, make sure that your network modules, all your service modules <coughs> your, that are plugged in, actually can cope with that kind of software level. So they had to replace some hardware as well. And something must have gone wrong there. I don't know. But they had a second router plugged in, 
and lifted the problem of God. So that's the funny piece. But it was just having one single trace file. And the key to it was that we were able to identify, well, the location here. So this is between Cisco and WatchGuide. In your trace, you just look at the Ethernet. It's always, MAC addresses are always attached to the local link. We don't cross any route. So this is how we found out where the capture location actually was. Make sense? <laughs> With this technique, I solved, the, let's say, two, two, more than two handful of, of, of cases, just moving the Wireshark around and looking for that symptom, previous, capture, previous segment not captured, to go away or to appear. And this stops the finger pointing, even if it hurts something, sometimes. So, I'm almost done. Hmm. Um, have you got any questions on that? Did it make sense what I said? But now, sometimes in my language, if uh, I can start speaking in English, but sometimes I don't recognize it anymore what I actually said. This is the fun part. It's like driving. So, um, I've got another war story, which also happened, which was really funny. And this is case number four. And since I prepared everything on the slides, let's just walk through the slides. And I, I would love to share you that story. That took us two or three months to really identify some root cause problems, because that, that was just not only just once, but many. So, we ran into a, an environment where Windows XP was just being replaced by Windows 7. So, on the, in the Windows XP environment, the customer had no problems downloading stuff from the internet. Now, with the pilot machines, Windows 7, they had some, some severe problems, and they had no clue what this was about. Now, there were two things, and one thing behind it was this kind of pattern. And this is just a small sample out of, out of, out of huge trace files. Oops. Sorry. So, um, have you ever seen a pattern like previous segment not captured and then out of order? Plus some retransmissions as well. But what could that probably possibly be? Previous segment not captured means there is a gap. <coughs> what does out of order mean? Action. Wrong sequence. So and if, if this happens or occurs just next to each other, what is the best, what, what would be your best guess? Buffer. Buffer? Probably. Mm -hmm. And so, there were two packets being swapped. I've got here TCP sequence number, next sequence in ACK, and the sequence number, if you look at that, it's 5161 and it's 9641. Now, if this happens to you, you've got to prove that this is really out of order. Some, so, somehow packets got mixed up. I had no clue around it. Now, just the proof that these were really that the packets were not in order. At that stage, there was no packet loss at all, nothing. The interesting thing is, if, do, do you know how the IP identification works? It's an IP ID, not only very famous by, by, from that song from Michael Patrick Kelly, look at your ID, well, it would be my best recommendation for, for you guys if you run into those kind of problems. Well, the IP ID it made is, is what makes a packet unique. And usually a sender for every new packet, it, 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 sets, it, it sets a new IP ID. <coughs> and it usually, in this case, shows you what the original order of the sender actually was. This, the, the, this number, 407, then 406. So this was sent out earlier than, that, than this. You've got to check the machines. And sometimes you've got larger gaps in the servers sometimes serving multiple 
a multiple connections at a time. Here it worked at 7, 6, 9, 8, 11, 10. So this is not packet loss. But the receiver suffered still. Because if packets arrive out of order at a receiver in TCP, what is the, what is the receiver going to do with it? Any ideas? Can the receiver just get them in order and add the entire stuff? Well, XP did it. Guess what? Windows 7 couldn't do it anymore. So they ran into really severe problems. And whenever there is a gap on the receiver side, the egg number stay, it gets stuck, plus selective acknowledgement. Those blocks come into play. So everything that comes out of order is being acknowledged through sec segments or selective acknowledgements. Now, <laughs> and actually this, this happens so often. And it was really amazing down to really annoying. They just did, we did a sample to download ADMX from a website, from a public website. And still, it was a huge problem. And when we sort it by IP ID and sequence number, we would see that the packets and the, the packet number in IP and the sequence number would follow upwards in a properly, proper way. But still, our packet order in the buffer wouldn't, wouldn't show up properly. Now, <laughs> who does that kind of things? Can you take a guess? Firewall, yeah. A firewall with a so-called fast path, so sometimes smaller packets over can, may overtake for larger packets. It was a firewall service module, and <coughs> the client received the packets out of a sequence. Well, what happened? We had this selective acknowledgement. For every gap, we had a SAC block. Well, now if, the, if you've got consecutive gaps bumping at the receiver's door, you've got to add more and more SAC blocks until you hit four. And the very moment when the number of SAC blocks exceeded four, or should exceed four, the oldest block by RC needed to be deleted. And then that was some, sometimes over 20 packets. All those 20 packets had to be retransmitted for sure. And by that, <laughs> the, the server went into the RTO timer and doubled the retransmission timeout. And this is where all those downloads died at an instant. So this was so funny. And I got to check whether I've got, I should have the, I, on. I've, I should have the trace uh, down here. This was this was the resolution, <coughs> or the, the what what ha what happened actually. Look at this. This is the RTO for any retransmission that is not a fast one. Can you look at the at the timers? You know, this is simple TCP. It's 200 milliseconds, 400, 800, 126, 323. Look at that. This is the maximum RTO. Windows on, let's say, Windows 7 Plus is actually doing. And that was the server. And so they <laughs> one packet every two minutes. I swear, you're out of luck. And it was just because those fi that firewall put things out of order. Now, the resolution to it, this was our network. And this, is the, this will be the end now of my presentation here. We captured here, it was a pure Cisco shop. We tried to, to capture on a span cord. Later, I, I, I added a tab to get accurate results. And this is where we had these packets out of order. We moved the distribution, same thing. We moved it to the core, same thing. We moved it. We moved it between those two firewalls, old model. Well, the number of swap packets was nearly half. And when we were capturing at the router, all packets arrived 
in the correct order. Well, usually my network managers claim that, well, packets arriving from the internet may arrive out of order due to parallel uh, <coughs> routes. Now, normally not. Well, the internet service providers may have parallel routes. Ro routing is a, is a cool thing, but <laughs> one stream uses one path. So the time to traverse the network is always the same. The order should, should stay the same. Otherwise, we're in deep shit. So being recorded again. <laughs> so that, that, that customer, it helps when we disable this function. But then the manufacturer said, well, you might run into overload in, in, within the firewall. Don't do it. We said, yeah. And this was just one root cause out of many. And the second thing was, and there was also a funny piece, after this was resolved, they could eventually use the network as desired, but only, let's say, in the afternoon between 2 and 5. They had still problems with packet loss. So, but it wasn't that, it weren't swap pocket packets anymore. And we did the same thing. And actually, we did, we looked at previous segment not captured. We saw the previous segment not captured here, which is again behind the fault domain. We went further up. We found out that the firewalls wouldn't be dropping any packets. So we were quite happy about it. But here, we were still behind the fault domain. And the guys here at that, at that shop wanted to call their provider, <laughs> which was the university itself, in the beautiful city of Hamburg. And this was near the, <laughs> the hospital of the university. Guess what? This guy was, dro was dropping packets. The router. And <laughs> this was a funny story. They had a gig internet connection, one gigabit per second. And they added the router that would have a hmm, capacity of 250 to 300 megabit per second on the internet mix packet. The internet mix means you've got different sizes at a certain distribution. But if the bandwidth was below those 250 or 300 megahertz per second, the router would just be fine. Well, once the bandwidth exceeded those 300, they would drop it packets again. Good story, eh? Well, the system integrator having supplied this router is not working for the hospital anymore. That's for sure. Because you cannot, you cannot sell a router that, that can cope with those connection. So that's the end of the story. And maybe I wanted to give you some ideas how you can tackle packet loss with the help of Wireshark. Sometimes the symptoms aren't 100% correct. I skipped that one due to <coughs> the lack of timing. But anyways, I hope you enjoyed the session. And um, <laughs>